Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to a new season of Hope Restored. So glad you could join us again today. We're going to be sharing with you some messages from uh, various speakers around the world over the next few weeks and months. And uh, so glad you could be with us on this journey. But let's start by worshipping our God. And we're going to celebrate who he is, what he's done for us and give him all the praise that he deserves. So let's stand together if we're able to do so and let's worship. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth, there's no way to measure what
Lord, I come before your throne. You give life, you 
shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. So just to remind you all that we meet on Thursdays at 12.45 in the afternoon and at 7.45 in the evening. And you're very welcome to join us on either of those occasions. Do also invite other people along. We're passionate about the things that we're sharing and the messages that we have put online for you. And these are great resources for people. So do get other people to come and to share these messages with us and uh, there will be a blessing to to others i'm sure so as we've uh, been worshiping i'm sure you've got excited about what god's going to do to uh, to you and through you in this service and with no more ado let's listen to the message for this week so this is uh, a message series from north point ministries and the message is uh, over three weeks. And this is, God has still got the whole world in his hands. One of the most um, dramatic moments, certainly in the Bible, but maybe in all of human history, took place in a, an environment that we have come to in our culture referred to as the upper room. Um, it, it took place at, toward the end of Jesus' ministry, and some of you know, know this story, we've all heard bits and pieces, and essentially he and his disciples were coming to Jerusalem, and they were going to celebrate Passover together. And Passover was this, this meal, it was kind of a festival, but it was a remembrance meal 
where the Jewish people would get together and have a meal and remember what had happened hundreds of years earlier when the Israelites were in Egyptian slavery and they had their last meal in Egypt and the next morning they were all going to get up and walk out of Egypt. And they'd been in Egypt for 400 years as a group of people started as a family that grew into a nation. And they, all they had known, their whole history as a nation, were they were slaves. Since the very beginning, all they had known was slavery. And they had prayed and prayed and prayed to their God. And for 400 years, their prayers went unanswered. 400 years, we, you know, we're at four days and we're like, is there a God? 400 years, their prayers had gone unanswered. And God finally sent them a deliverer, Moses. And Moses said, tomorrow... We're leaving. And tonight, an angel of death, as it was referred to, is going to pass over the land of Egypt and kill every single someone, someone for the firstborn from every single family that does not have the blood of a lamb over the doorpost, on the doorpost and, and over the door. And so the Israelites, taking Moses at his word, slaughtered a lamb, had a meal, put the blood on their doorpost, if you heard the story from the Old Testament. And that night, the angel of death passed over the land of Egypt. And the next morning, Pharaoh said, you may go now. And that was the last meal. That was the last supper. That was the last time family, Israelite families gathered in Egypt. And the next day, they packed up everything they owned, plus everything the Egyptians gave them. The Bible says they loaded them up with wealth, and they left Egypt and headed to what would be known as the promised land. Now, 1,400 years after that event, 1,400 years after that event, Jesus is going to gather with his disciples to have the Passover meal. Now, they had done this before, but this was different. Um, there had been a time when they had gathered for the Passover meal and things were going great because Jesus was a star. Jesus was a celebrity. He was a cultural icon that thousands of people gathered to hear him speak and the disciples were feeling like, hey, we're on the left and right hand side of this, this guy and things are going great and there's a lot of momentum and the crowds are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and the miracles are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But as they were about to gather for this, we call it the Last Supper because it was the last time he would share Passover with them on this earth, things weren't going well. The momentum had turned around. There were rumors that there were a group of people trying to arrest Jesus, trying to isolate him from the crowd, get him alone and arrest him and accuse him of all kinds of things. And the disciples knew that if Jesus went down, they would go down with him. And then he began talking about his death. And, and he, he talked about being taken and they, they just sort of filtered all of that out because in their way of thinking, much like our way of thinking, if God is with you and, and if God is you know, working with you and if God is moving around you, then things get better. Because wherever God shows up, Things get better. Wherever God shows up, there, there's more certainty, not less certainty. But they found themselves at a time where there, there were just, there, things weren't going well. And in fact, generally, Jesus would, send, would tell them, hey, we're going to celebrate Passover in this city, and you guys go get ready. And here they were the, the night, actually the afternoon of Passover, and Jesus still hadn't even told them where they're going to celebrate Passover. They were going to Jerusalem. He said, when I go to Jerusalem, things are going to get really, really bad. And of course, they're like us. They're going, so why are we going there? It was as if he had a death wish. It was as if he, he was going to walk right into the jaws of death. Things are going to be bad when we get to Jerusalem. Follow me. They get to the outskirts of Jerusalem, and they stop, and they wait for the sun to set. And Jesus sends two of them into town to meet a mysterious man who takes them to a mysterious place. And somehow Jesus has prearranged Passover, but he never told his disciples about it. Because this was a time when he wasn't even sure he could trust them. And as it turns out, he couldn't. He didn't want anyone to know where they would be because they would be isolated from the crowds and vulnerable. So they sneak into Jerusalem under the cover of night. Not a big celebration, not people shouting Hosanna, not all of the other things they had experienced. They sneak into Jerusalem under the cover of night and they go to this home and they go upstairs and they gather in this upper room. And it was just strange and it was eerie and there was no certainty. And then if that wasn't bad enough, Jesus begins the conversation this way. I'm in Mark chapter 14 if you want to follow along. Mark chapter 14 verse 17. It says, when evening came, Jesus arrived with the 12, verse 18, and while they were reclining at the table eating, he said, truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. Literally, one of you is going to hand me over. And nobody in the room raised their hand and said, hand you over to who? They already knew the answer to that question. The momentum had shifted. Things were not going well. One, he says, who is eating 
with me. This punctuated the insult. To eat with somebody in that culture is much like eating with someone in our culture. It would be like having someone in your home and saying, thank you for coming to my home. By the way, I know that you're going to betray me. They're in the most intimate setting possible in that culture, much like our culture. And he says, not only is it one of you, it's one of you who has chosen to gather with me around this sacred table to celebrate this amazing thing God has done. And one of you who is eating with me. It's going to betray me. Verse 19, they were saddened or disappointed. And one by one they said to him, surely not I. Surely not I. Surely not I. Surely it's not me. Verse 20, it is one of the twelve, he replied. One who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go. That is, things are going to go as God predicted. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe. To that man who betrays the Son of Man, it would be better for him if he had not been born. This book, the Bible, is full of stories and full of narratives written and taking place in the midst of extraordinary uncertainty. In fact, I would say this. As we as families and people and as a nation and as a culture face uncertainty like we've never faced it before, this is the perfect place to run. Because your favorite Bible story, the story that you were raised with that you love to hear repeated again, your favorite passage of scripture, your favorite psalm, perhaps even your favorite proverb if you have one of those, was written and reflected a time of extraordinary uncertainty. This is not a book about rich people having fun. This isn't, a, this isn't a book about, and then things went great, and Monday they went even better, then Tuesday you got a job, and Wednesday you got a raise, and Thursday you got a bonus, and then my kids all you know, became professional athletes and went to medical school on a scholarship. I mean, that, all those, you know, those, those kind of wrinkle-free life things, and then they lived happily ever after, and there was no divorce in the land, and God, you know, there, it's not in there. That every single narrative, every single passage, the thing that we draw hope and security from, all of those come from times, troubled, troubled, troubled times, from the lives of people who discovered that in the midst of uncertainty, God was still certain. That in the midst of uncertainty, when you couldn't even trace God's hand, when it seems like he, he seemed like he was absent you know, to the 10th power, they discovered that God was still trustworthy. If ever there was a time for us to pick this up and read it, it is now. This is where we find the story that we're, many of us are familiar with about the teenager Joseph, not Mary and Joseph, Joseph, but a teenager Joseph in the Old Testament, and I know you've had some problems with your older brothers, you know, who finds himself in the bottom of a well, and above he hears his brothers having this conversation, should we sell him or kill him? Should we sell him or kill him? I don't know. Let's sell him. No, let's kill him. Let's sell him. I, I realize you have sibling rivalry. There's some issues at home, you know, over an inheritance or over, you know, she wore my blouse and didn't iron it and threw it back on the bed and na, 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 na. I mean, I realize and it's not fair and it's not fair. And Joseph is in the bottom of a well. Do we sell him or do we kill him? And you read the story and discover, believe it or not, that God was actually with Joseph. And you read a story about David, King David, who eventually the Messiah would come from his lineage. And he's awakened one day, and I know you have problems with your kids. He's awakened one day to discover that his son has raised an army and is about to invade the capital city to conquer him as king and to replace him as king. Again, we've had trouble with our kids. An army to destroy his father. And you read the story and you discover that God was in the middle of that and with David. Then there's the story that most of us heard growing up about a a mother who had a baby son and like any mother who loved her son and was told that Pharaoh had decided to murder all the baby boys because there were too many Israelites in the land. And I realized there's so much emotion around babies and there's so much emotion around children and so many prayers are prayed for sick children and too many of us in ministry have buried too many children. But here's a mother who wraps up her newborn son and puts him in a basket and shoves him out into the Nile River as if to say, if it's between the crocodiles and the Egyptian butchers, I'll take my chances with the river. And you read the story and you discover God was there. And the little baby was found and they named him Moses and he became the deliverer of the nation. But before she knew the end of the story, Where was God in that? And then a reflection or a foreshadowing of another baby that would be rescued from a similar fate. As Mary and Joseph discovered that Herod, in his jealousy for for his kingdom, 
you know, working under the guise of a, of a rumor that had been spread that there was a baby being born that would grow up to be the Jewish king, decided instead of trying to find the baby to just wipe out an entire generation of Jewish little boys and sent his butchers into Bethlehem and the surrounding area and murdered every single baby and she escapes of all places back to Egypt to save the baby Jesus. And as there was weeping and wailing in the land, you read the story and you discover that God was right there in the middle of all that. That God somehow still had the whole world in his hands. That all those things, every single story, I mean, you read them for yourself, at every single story where it seems like things have spun out of control and all the momentum is backwards momentum and all God's activity has ceased and the bad guys won, and the evil king won, and the gods of the pagan empires had won. You read those stories and you discover in the midst of that extraordinary uncertainty, there's God, and nothing has changed, and he still has the whole world in his hands. Let me read the rest of this, verse 22. And while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and I'm telling you, this sucked the breath right out of these guys. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when his disciples, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to the disciples, and he said, oh yeah, by the way, this isn't what you think it is. You've, you've been taking Passover, eating the Passover meal since you were children, but from now on when you eat it, this is my body. And Luke says, Jesus said, this is my body that's been broken for you. What do you mean this is your body? This is all that death talk again. This is all that negativity. Don't want to hear it. If you're from God, then things have to turn around. If you're from God, then things go well. If you're from God, there needs to be more certainty, not less certainty. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said this, verse 24, this is the, my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. And he foreshadows what's going to take place hours later when he's going to be nailed to a cross and die in front of their very eyes. Then they leave that room and they're going to the Garden of Gethsemane where there's so much drama and he's eventually arrested and on the way, the news got worse, verse 27, he says this, oh yeah, by the way, not only will one of you betray me, all of you, verse 27, you will all fall away, Jesus told him, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered, but after I have risen, and they never heard this part, but after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. And Peter's following along and he's thinking, enough of this, enough negative, enough bad news, enough about death, enough about arrest, enough about betrayal. There is no way we're gonna allow this to happen because if God is with you and if you're the son of God, this isn't how the story goes. There's more certainty, there's more faith, there's more miracles, there's more activity, there's more intervention. In verse 29 he says, but Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not because that's not how the story's supposed to go. Even if everybody abandons you, I'm not gonna fall away. I'll stick with you through the end. And later that very same man with all of this faith would listen to a young girl accuse him of being one of Jesus' followers and he would deny him three times. Now here's my question for you and for me. As we move into this series and as we continue to experience extraordinary uncertainty in our families, in our jobs, with our children, with our culture, with our leadership, with our Congress, with our Senate, with our government leaders and our state leaders, with our economy, with our retirement, with our scholarships, with our ability to go to school, stay in school, continue school, with all of that uncertainty, here's, here's the question. Can you trust God? Can you trust God? Can you maintain faith in God when there's absolutely no evidence of his activity in your life? Can you continue to embrace faith in God as a personal heavenly father when there is absolutely no evidence of his activity in your life, in your culture, in our country, seemingly at times in our world? Your answer to that question will determine your response to the continual and continuing uncertainty in our country. 
your answer to that question, my answer to that question, will determine, will determine our response to the uncertainty in our country, in our lives, with our children, with our families, with our parents. The, the strange thing is this, and here's, here's the dilemma. And, and for three weeks, I just wanna keep pointing to this because it's so extraordinarily important, especially for Americans that equate God with prosperity. And why shouldn't we? We've been so incredibly prosperous who equate God with forward motion. And why shouldn't we? Most of us have experienced primarily forward motion that, ex that, that equate God and God's presence and blessing with physical, tangible blessing. And why shouldn't we? That's been the experience for many of us for generations. But I imagine if you were to go to the disciples, these men gathered at this table months later and ask them this question, Guys, when was the darkest moment as you followed Jesus? When was it the most, when was it darkest? When did you have the least amount of hope? When did you begin to wonder, maybe we made a mistake following him? Maybe he's another false messiah. Maybe we've wasted our lives. Maybe we've, when were the darkest moments? And I believe they would have said to you, it began when we gathered around the dinner table and realized things aren't gonna get better. It's when we gathered around the table that night and he promised us things would get worse. And that not only would one of us betray him, him, all of us would fall away. And within a few hours, all of us had fallen away. And the one man that said he would never fall away had denied him three times. And then hours later, we saw him arrested. We saw him tried. We saw him die. You wanna know when the darkest hours were for us? It was those hours when we realized we have completely wasted our time and God isn't up to anything here. And then if we'd said, where in your time with Jesus do you think God was doing his greatest work? Was it healing the lame guy? What about healing the blind guy? Well, that was pretty amazing. Or maybe it was standing outside the tomb of Lazarus when Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. He'd been in there for literally stinking days and he came out of the tomb. Was, was that the time when you felt, saw that God's presence was most with you? I mean, when, looking back, when was God doing the most? <laughs> and they would have said, those same hours when it seemed to us he was doing the least. Those very same hours when it seemed like he was absent, when he was missing, because in those darkest, darkest hours, God was doing his greatest work. And those darkest, darkest hours when it seemed he was completely inactive, he was most active. Because those darkest hours were the epicenter of the salvation of mankind. That God was more, this, these would be the hours that for th literally thousands of years, people all over the world would look back to and rejoice in God's goodness and grace. But if you'd ask us in the moment, we would have said, game over, waste of time, not a man of God, we have wasted our lives. And that's a difficult message for us. And that's a difficult message for American Christians. And yet, it is our story as those of us, for those of us who've chosen to follow God. And specifically for those of us who've decided to place our faith in Jesus. And it's not only your story because we're reflected in the story of the gospel. It's our story because that's, for many of us, that's our experience. That God seems to take broken things and do his most amazing work. That God seems to wait for the last minute to do his amazing work. That God tends to think busted up, broken, hopeless situations and show up in a way not the way we would choose because we would never allow things to get as bad as oftentimes they get. But this is God's way. The greatest things begin in the biggest messes. The most amazing works of God generally are launched at a time of personal or national brokenness. This is what God does. But the question for you and the question for me is will we maintain faith when we cannot see his hand? And as our faith begins to stutter and as our faith begins to shake a little bit and as our faith begins to waver and we begin to look to the left and the right and we look at circumstances and we begin to doubt, now more than ever, this is the place to go because all of these stories and all of these words and the story of our salvation was birthed at a time of extraordinary darkness 
an extraordinary uncertainty. You say, well, Andy, that's, that's, that's neat. That, that's neat, and it's, it's, it's even a little bit inspirational, but that's not going to help me get a job. And, and that's not going to get my kids back in school. And that's not going to change anything tomorrow when my wife goes back to work and we find out of whether or not she's going to be able to keep her job. And that won't get me a commission. And that won't change anything about my prodigal son or my prodigal daughter. And that doesn't make me well. And you're right. And never has there been a time as a pastor or a church leader that I've wanted to figure out faster or quicker how we could do practical things to help people more. But here's what I know, because this is our message. That although that idea, that insight, that, that truth about the scripture doesn't change anything in our circumstances, here's what it does. It allows you to embrace uncertainty with the certainty of knowing that God is still in control. That although life is uncertain, God is not uncertain. Although life is uncertain and family is uncertain and the economy is uncertain and the world seems to be uncertain, God is not uncertain. He still has the whole world in his hands. And this knowledge and embracing it, even if it's just with our fingernails holding on, it allows us not, it keeps us from making decisions that even further complicate the difficulties that we're facing. It allows you to go to bed at night and as we'll talk about in a couple of weeks, discover that there is, there is, there is a way to have peace even in the midst of this storm. It will teach us to keep an eye out for the activity of God that may take us by surprise as it often took the characters of scripture by surprise. To hang on to and to embrace the simple truth that even though life is uncertain, God is not uncertain. And he still has the whole world, he still has your entire world in his hands. Now, that's easy for me to sit up here and say because I don't have to walk up the, out the door and get in your car and go back to your home or go back to your circumstances. I don't have to get up tomorrow morning like I know many in our congregation are doing and wonder, what am I going to do today? I don't have to go home and figure out how am I going to stay in school. I realize our circumstances are all very different and what gives me the nerve to sit up here and try to encourage you? Am I painting a picture of you know, pie in the sky by and by? Is this just kind of a pep talk so that you'll go out and maintain faith? Is this, is this just what the preacher's supposed to say? I understand all that. And especially if you're new to faith, or you've been burned by the church before, or you have a bad negative experience, or you watched a parent go through a difficult, difficult, difficult time, and the church just kept sort of, you know, pumping all this sweet, nice message out to your parents, and you never saw it take hold, and you never saw it make a difference. I understand that. But here's what I'd say. The foundation of my message today is this, not my life. But I recently ran into a guy that gave me the extraordinary courage I would need to bring these next three messages to you. I want to tell you a story real quick. When Sandra and I um, were in Washington, D.C. for the National Prayer Service, and I think this will be the last time I bring it up, I promise. This won't be the perpetual sermon illustration, okay? There were only three remarkable things about that, and this is the second one. I'm not sure the third one will ever be shared. But we um, had been told that we were going to have an opportunity to meet the president, Barack Obama. And so they took us to the basement of the National Cathedral, which was a giant room, sort of a big wide hall, and they said we were to wait there. And we were down there about 30 minutes waiting. And they lined us up in order that we were to meet the president because he, somebody was going to read a list of names so he would hear our names and we'd be in the right order. So they put us in order, but we weren't standing in line. We were just spread out down this wide hall. And at the end of the hall were four steps and then a hallway and it, and it dead ended into this wall and then a hallway cut this way. And so the president was going to come around this corner and was going to greet us. He's going to be at the top of these four stairs, four or five stairs. And as it turned out, I was in line behind a gentleman that I just met named Reverend Otis Moss. Reverend Otis Moss. Reverend Moss was born in 1935. He was an African American born in middle Georgia in 1935. When he was 16 years old, he was orphaned. I do not and have not been able to find out the circumstances of that, but he lost both parents. So he was a 16 year old African American male in middle Georgia in 1951 and saw the worst that this country has had to offer in a long, long time. And yet at 19 years old, while he was still a teenager, put his faith in Christ actually earlier than that. But at 19 years old, decided he wanted to go into the ministry and be a preacher. 
And through the years, he was able to connect with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He marched with him in Selma. He marched with him in Washington, D.C. Became a part of that, that core group of men and women that experienced things that hopefully nobody in this country will ever have to experience again. He experienced the loss of a friend. He, he experienced the division of family. He experienced hate, racism and hatred that we, for most of us, we can't even imagine. And yet through all of that time, he maintained his faith. And as he was sharing this with me, because I'd never met him personally before, he had his back to the stairs where the president was to come in. And I'm just asking as many questions I can and trying to be as quiet as I can just to listen to this man. And as he shared these stories and conversations with Coretta Scott King, and just, uh, just unbelievable history right there in front of me, in the middle of a sentence, he just stopped and this sounds so much like a preacher story, but I promise this is exactly how it happened. He just stopped talking to me, and he turned and just kind of stared off into space. And here's what he said. And we know, I mean, just out of the blue. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. And he just stopped. He quoted the first half of Romans 8, 28. And we know, just, I mean, he wasn't, he was telling me a story. And we know that, in, and he says it, I don't want to try to imitate his awesome black preacher voice. And we know that in all things, and I'm thinking, yeah, and you have seen some all things. The all things that fall into your all things are nothing like the things that have fallen into my all things. The all things that he has experienced are much different than the all things that many of us have experienced or will ever experience. And we know that in all things, God works. And we know that in all things, God works to the benefit of those who love him. And I'm standing there real quiet. And then he turned back to me and he said, but Pastor Stanley, sometimes it takes him a while. And that's when I just had, I just lost it. I thought, oh my gosh. And sometimes, but sometimes, it takes him a while. And then behind him, I saw the Secret Service stand up straight and turn, and there was movement. And around the corner comes the first African American president of the United States of America. And Reverend Moss turned around, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh. I, I can't even begin to understand or appreciate the gravity or the significance of this moment. And he went forward and shook the president's hand. And, and I thought to myself, I'm about to meet a president, but I've just had a conversation with a saint. I've had a conversation with a man who understands in a way that I will never understand, in a way that most of us will never understand, but in a way that we all need to understand. That when life is uncertain, God is not. And he still has the whole world in his hands. And he still has your world and your family in his hands. And he still has your world and your family in his hands. And he still has your personal finances and all the things that are worrying us to death and the reality of that in his hands. And I had just met a man who maintained faith through things I can't even imagine. And here he is in his mid-70s, who's able to say with absolute confidence that our God works, is active, is present, is evident in all things, fill in the blank any way you want to, for those who love him. And he didn't finish the verse, and who are called according to his purposes. My friends, I don't know what the future holds for us as a nation or for families or as a city any more than anyone else does. But here's what I know. Although life is uncertain, God is not. And he still has the whole world in his hands. That even though life is uncertain, God is not. And he still has your world in his hands. And regardless of what we see or don't see, we have the opportunity to embrace a faithful, faithful God, even through circumstances where it is very difficult or maybe impossible to see his hand or to catch a glimpse of his faith. Because God 
is still in control. God is still on his throne. God is still a God we can worship with abandon. And God is a God that we can continue to trust. That even though our lives are uncertain, he's not. He still has our whole world in his hands. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, for some of us today, this is a lifeline. It's our only lifeline. Father, for others of us, it's next week we're going to need this. It's next month we're going to need this. It's this summer we're going to need this. Because only you know the future. And Father, I pray that in the uncertainty to come, that we would be the people that would cling to and hold on to, not our ability to interpret circumstance, not our propensity to judge you based on what you do and you don't do, but we would be the men and women that declare you faithful God, faithful God, faithful God, in spite of what we see and experience. Father, we confess together today that we believe that you work in all things, that you work through all things, that you show your hand strong in all things, that you are in control of all things. You're the God of certainty, even when life is uncertainty and certain. And you still have our whole world in your hands. Father, as we leave here today, give us the wisdom to know how to express that how to talk about that with our families, how to talk about that at work, how to live that out. And I pray, Father, that we would discover how to find peace in times that have and share and provide no peace. Father, I pray for our fathers who are leading their children and leading their families through these uncertain times. Give them wisdom to know how to lead. For our single moms and our single dads, who have the, the extra difficulty and the burden of being the only provider or the only one in the home with the kids. Give them wisdom to know how to lead their kids to embrace a God when times are so uncertain. Father, as a church, lead us and guide us to know what to do with what's happening around us. But I pray that we would go to bed every single night with the confidence that you've not changed, that you're still a God who can be trusted, and you are a God who works through broken things in difficult times to do your greatest work. And I pray all of that in the amazing name of Jesus. Amen. Well, what a great message that was. And uh, we've got more of that coming over the next couple of weeks. So do join us for those. So we're going to uh, be having a Zoom meeting, as I said earlier, after the final song if you're able to join us then that'd be great and if you can't then that's fine um, but do uh, stay with us for the final song and reflect upon all the things that God has been saying to you have a good week God bless you and hope to see you again soon
Your faithfulness, your faith.